back for the laureate lecture in computer science. And you see that we also changed studios here in Heidelberg. We are now in the new aula. And it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Scott Aronson, the recipient of the 2020 ACM Prize in Computing for groundbreaking con contributions to quantum computing. Scott was honored for his far-reaching theoretical, technical, and educational contributions. Scott is also not new to the HLF. He actually spoke here in the hot topic at the fourth HLF on quantum computing. And it's great to have him back. And a lot of things happened since then. Today, he will tell us about quantum computational supremacy and the new developments in this field. Scott, we are looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Can you see me and uh, hear me? And can you see the uh, slides? I see everything, so I hope great. everyone else too. <laughs> okay, great. So it, it's an honor to be invited back here. Uh, when I spoke at HLF in uh, 2016, uh, quantum computational supremacy was a proposal, uh, was a, a, an idea that some of us were pursuing. Uh, now it's uh, experiments that have been done. So, uh, so a lot has changed since then, and I'm excited to tell you about it. Uh, it's also, it's a particular honor for me to uh, follow uh, Avi Wigderson. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, a, a humbling to have to follow him, actually, but uh, I see that he led up perfectly to the uh, subject of, of uh, quantum computation. So uh, thank you, Avi. Um, so, uh, uh, so this talk is called Quantum Computational Supremacy. Now, uh, some people dislike that term. Um, either because they feel it promises too much or because it, it reminds uh, uh, people of uh, 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 evil kinds of supremacy. So they've proposed alternative terms like uh, advantage, superiority, inimitability. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, my, my personal feeling was that, you know, rather than ceding words to uh, racists or whatever, we should proudly reclaim them for uh, things like quantum computing that, you know, uh, everyone from, from all countries and cultures uh, can work on together. Uh, but um, uh, other people feel differently. So, you know, I will sometimes use the term quantum supremacy just because that's the term we've been using for the past decade. Uh, but I'll sometimes use the other terms as well, like, like uh, quantum advantage. Um, so uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, explain uh, what this is, I first have to tell you, you know, what is quantum computation? In order to do that, uh, I first have to tell you what is quantum mechanics. So uh, the way that we uh, tend to think about quantum mechanics in computer science is uh, it's, a, it's a strange set of rules you know, that were discovered in the 1920s for how to calculate the probability that something happens. Uh, and, you know, it, it's almost a, a level beneath physics uh, as normally understood. You know, if you like, it is quantum mechanics is an operating system. Okay? It's one that as far as we know, everything else in nature runs on as application programs. Uh, you know, the, the standard model of particle physics. Uh, you know, you, you may have heard that, that there, there is some difficulty in porting general relativity to run on this operating system. Okay, but, but everything else uh, uh, works great on it. Uh, and I like to say that um, for me, qu quantum mechanics is much simpler once you take the physics out of it. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we won't be talking uh, directly about, about particles uh, or, or, or f fields. Uh, we'll be talking about bits or, you know, the, the quantum version of bits, which are, which are qubits and, and just the, the, the logic that they obey. Okay, so now the central thing that quantum mechanics uh, asserts uh, about the world is that if you've got any isolated physical system uh, whatsoever, uh, could be a photon, could be an atom, in principle, it could even be the whole universe, okay, then its state is described by a unit vector of complex numbers, okay, and uh, uh, these are called amplitudes, right, and uh, uh, they're kind of like the, the quantum mechanical uh, analog of, of probabilities, okay, so, uh, a qubit or a quantum bit is just a bit that has uh, an amp some amplitude to be zero and some other amplitude to be one. 
And this is the, the basic building block of uh, uh, almost everything we do in quantum computation. Okay, so uh, we can denote the state of a qubit. If we're physicists, we would do it uh, using what's called the Dirac-Ket notation. Uh, we would uh, write it as A times the zero state plus B times the one state. Okay, and we uh, use these funny uh, asymmetrical uh, angle brackets. Uh, th those are uh, called cats. Okay, so it's, it's some linear combination, uh, a complex linear combination, actually, of the zero state and the one state. Uh, as mathematicians or computer scientists, we could also simply think of it as a vector. Okay, it's a unit vector in C squared. Okay, we could just write it as A, B, where A and B are two complex numbers, or you know the uh, uh, um, sum of uh, uh, the magnitude of a squared and the magnitude of b squared is one. It's a unit vector. Okay, so uh, if we uh, uh, thought about real amplitudes only, then the possible states of a single qubit uh, uh, are just form a circle, uh, uh, the unit circle. Okay, you know if we include the complex parts, then we would get a sphere which I can't quite uh, represent uh, uh, on, this, on this virtual whiteboard. I don't have enough dimensions. But, uh, um, you know, in the real case, we have, uh, uh, let's say, the horizontal direction, which we could label as the state zero. We have the vertical direction, which we could label as the state one. And then we have a whole continuum of intermediate possibilities, such as zero plus one over the square root of two. And if I have amplitude for both zero and for one, we call that a superposition of the zero state and the one state. Okay, this uh, 45 degree one, the zero plus one over square root of two is an equal superposition of zero and one. Okay, now uh, here are the basic rules uh, in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Okay, you can measure a qubit, which means sort of look at it to ask it whether let's say it's a zero or a one. Now, if you do that, you force it to pick one of them, okay? And uh, it, so it will snap to one or the other. And the choice it makes is probabilistic. Uh, it will tell you that it is zero with probability absolute value of A squared. It will tell you that it's one with probability absolute value of B squared. And whichever choice it makes, it then sticks with it. Okay, so if it tells you that it's zero, then it, it now is in the state zero. And, uh, you know, if you measure it again, nothing having happened, it, uh, it will still tell you that it's in the state zero. Okay, so all other information that there may have been in the qubit before you measured it is now gone. Okay, all you can see is this one outcome, you know, in this case, zero. Okay, um, so, uh, um, but now crucially, Besides just measuring a qubit and you know collapsing it to to one outcome or the other one, uh, you can also transform its state by uh, taking the vector of amplitudes and applying a linear transformation to that vector. Okay, now uh, the linear in order for this to make sense, the linear transformation will have to preserve the norm. Okay, it will have to preserve uh, that the, the the magnitude of the vector is one. You know, otherwise the probabilities wouldn't even add up to one. Okay, now a, a, a norm-preserving linear transformation of, uh, uh, of a complex vector is simply what, what in math we would call a unitary transformation. Okay, so we can apply unitary transformations. Uh, an example of a, a one qubit unitary transformation would be uh, this one that I've called R, which is just, uh, it, it takes the vector uh, 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 the quantum state vector and applies a 45 degree counterclockwise rotation to it. Okay, you know there are there are many other examples you could write down. Uh, 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 although you know they'll, they'll all be sort of uh, products of reflections and rotations. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, crucially, applying these unitary transformations has the potential to create interference. Um, um, which means, you know, the, uh, an amplitude could be a sum of different contributions where, let's say, some are positive and others are negative, and they can cancel each other out, okay? This is the central signature of quantum behavior in the world. Uh, uh, um, um, 
So, you know, that if you have an event that can happen one way with a positive amplitude and another way with a negative amplitude, then the two contributions can, as we say, interfere destructively so that uh, the total amplitude will be zero and that event will never happen at all. Okay. Uh, uh, Richard Feynman used to say that all of quantum mechanics is contained in this one phenomenon of, of interference. You know, everything else is just sort of logical consequences of it. Okay, so let's take an example just to be concrete. Suppose that I took that unitary transformation called R, which applies a 45 degree rotation to my vector. And suppose that I apply it twice to uh, a qubit, which is initially in the zero state. Okay, well, you know, sort of we know what has to happen, right? Two 45 degree rotations equal a 90 degree rotation. So that qubit has to rotate from zero to the zero plus one over square root of two state, and then again, rotate again so that it's the one state, okay? But, you know, if we think more explicitly about what's going on, well, the, uh, the first, uh, application of R maps the zero state to zero plus one over the square root of two. Okay. Now, what about the second application? Okay. Well, by linearity, I can always think of a unitary acting on a superposition of just as just a superposition of, you know, each component just sort of acted on separately by that unitary. So I get R zero plus R one over the square root of two. Okay. Now, what is that? Well, R0, again, is 0 plus 1 over the square root of 2. Um, R1 is minus 0 plus 1 over the square root of 2. Okay, so, so now uh, if we look at uh, uh, what we get overall, we find that there were sort of two different paths that could have led us back to the zero state. Okay, but one of those paths had a positive amplitude. That's this one here and the other path had a negative amplitude, and so they canceled each other out. Okay, whereas, you know, there were two paths that led us from the zero state to the one state, namely this one and this one, and they both had positive amplitudes, so they reinforced each other, okay? They contributed uh, uh, constructively, and the result is that I just end up in the one state. Hey, this is a, uh, uh, in some level, just a fancy language for describing, you know, linear transformations of vectors. Okay, but this is people. This is what people mean when they talk about um, interference of amplitudes. Right. This is the central thing that amplitudes can do in quantum mechanics that conventional probabilities, uh, which are real numbers from zero to one, uh, would not do. Right. Conventional probabilities, uh, they always just add up constructively. So if I increase the number of ways for a thing to happen, it can only increase the probability that it will happen. Okay, whereas with amplitudes, I could increase the number of ways for something to happen, and it could decrease the probability that it happens because, uh, because of interference. Okay, if some ways it happens with positive and others with negative amplitude, they can cancel each other out. Okay, so that, that's already pretty interesting. But uh, where things get, get even more uh, uh, surprising is when we consider uh, a state uh, of not just one qubit, but of uh, a large number of qubits. Let's say, you know, n qubits, where n is a, a thousand or a million or something. Okay, because, you know, the, the rules of quantum mechanics are unequivocal that uh, if, I, if I want to describe uh, the state of n qubits, I now need a vector of two to the n of these amplitudes. Okay, uh, why is that? Well, it's because I need an amplitude for every possible n bit string, right? Every possible string of n bits, you know, and there are two to the n of them, of course, represents a possible outcome of my measuring all, you know, n of these qubits. And therefore, each one needs its own amplitude. Okay, uh, and another way to think about that is that in general, uh, qubits could be entangled with one another. Okay, entangled is just the quantum mechanical version of correlated, right? It means that the, the measurement outcomes need not be independent of one another. Um, so for example, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, Avi already uh, spoke about this in his talk, but you know, if I had a state 
like zero, zero plus one, one over the square root of two. This was, you know, the famous example introduced by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen. If I measured one of the qubits and I saw that it was zero, then immediately I would know that the other qubit is also zero. And likewise, if I measure one qubit and I see that it's one, then I know that the other one is also one. Okay, so, so in general, the qubits could be correlated in this way, as, as we say, entangled. And to describe an entangled state of n qubits, I need a vector in C to the two to the n. Okay, so, uh, so what does that mean concretely? It means if I had just a thousand qubits, which is not that many, right? You could easily need a thousand qubits just to describe, for example, you know, the electrons in a single fairly small molecule, right? Each electron has a spin state, which is a qubit. You know, it has an energy level, which you can also use as a qubit, right? So, so, so each electron, you know, already takes several qubits to describe. You know, as a small molecule, I could already have a thousand qubits. And um, this is saying that I need a vector of two to the thousand power amplitudes. Okay, so now that is two, two to the thousand is uh, more than um, 10 to the 300. Okay, which is the the uh, uh, which is much greater than the number of subatomic particles in the entire observable universe. As so, you know, I drew these spiral galaxies just to uh, 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 indicate the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Right, uh, uh, we're saying that just to keep track of the state of a few measly particles, somehow nature has to maintain some scratch paper uh, with more parameters than would fit in the entire observable universe. Okay, and every time something happens to those particles, nature has to cross off all of those parameters and replace them with new parameters. Okay, so this is a staggering claim about you know, uh, the nature of the world. Uh, you know, it is the reason why quantum mechanics seems to be exponentially hard to simulate on conventional computers, you know, on, on Turing machines. Uh, it is the reason why uh, a quantum computer, uh, at least on its face, you know, a computer that is built out of qubits uh, might be able to do much better, might be able to solve some problems in polynomial time, even though, you know, simulating what's happening with a classical computer, you know, could be done, but would be exponentially slower. Um, having said that, uh, I, I want to, to uh, um, um, immediately caution you. Okay, that, uh, you know, if you read almost any popular article that has been written about quantum computing in the past 25 years, okay, it will uh, say something, you know, that, that sounds good, but that is highly misleading. Okay, it will say that a quantum computer is, you know, kind of like a classical computer, except, you know, you just get this massive amount of free parallelism, right? You get to try every possible solution, for example, to your NP complete problem, or you know, every possible key to your cryptographic code in superposition. You know, you get you know some amplitude for each one. Or, you know, sometimes people will even say you get to try each one in a different parallel universe. And then you get to instantly pick the best one somehow, right? And there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, so many uh, um, startup companies, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in quantum computing right now, you know, that would like their customers and like their investors to sort of think that that is how it is. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's really much more subtle from, uh, than that. And, you know, when we've understood that since the, the very beginning of this field, Right? And the main problem is that for a computer to be useful, at some point you have to look at it, you have to measure it, you have to read an output from, from the computer. Now, uh, you can, with a quantum computer, create an equal superposition over all possible strings of length n, right? over all two to the n, uh, for example, pop potential solutions to an NP complete problem. Okay, that's even a very easy thing to do with a quantum computer. Uh, the trouble is, if you just observe that, not having done anything else, then the rules of quantum mechanics are unequivocal that all you're going to see will be a uniformly random output string, right? You'll see each string X with probability equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude of X. Okay, and so, so all you would get that way would be a uniformly random answer. 
Well, if that's all you wanted, you didn't need a quantum computer for that. Right. You could have just taken any, you know, suitable source of noise or just, you know, flipped a coin a bunch of times and maybe you know, saved yourself billions of dollars. OK, so what this means is that the only hope of a quantum speed up or of an advantage from using a quantum computer is to exploit interference you know, between positive and negative amplitudes, which is, after all, is, is the central thing that amplitudes do, which probabilities don't do. Okay, to exploit interference to boost the amplitudes of the outputs that you want to see. Well, so, 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 so with every quantum algorithm, the game is to somehow choreograph a pattern of interference such that for each right answer, uh, the different contributions to its amplitude uh, reinforce each other, have amplitudes that are pointing mostly in the same direction. Whereas for each wrong answer, which answer you don't want to see, uh, you want the contributions to its amplitude to cancel each other out. You know, some being positive, some being negative, some pointing, you know, maybe in random different directions in the complex plane. Okay. Uh, now, if you can arrange that, then when you measure, the right answer will be seen with a high probability. Okay. And, uh, you know, if, if you don't see it, you can always just repeat your computation from the beginning uh, until you do see it. Okay, but uh, uh, you know the, the trick is you know you need a, a, a large probability on the right answer you know larger than you could have gotten with a classical computer. Okay, you need it to be fast, faster than a classical computer could have done the same thing because you know otherwise what's the point? And um, you uh, um, you need to do this even though you yourself don't know in advance which answer is the right one. Right? Because if you knew that, then why, why would you have needed the quantum computer? So, you know, a priori, we should only expect this to work for some special tasks, right? Nature is giving us this extremely strange hammer here. You know, I think stranger than any science fiction writer would have had the imagination to invent. Okay, and it's the task of the quantum algorithm designer to sort of find some nails that that hammer can hit. Okay, so now I come to uh, uh, the subject of you know quantum supremacy, quantum advantage. You know, I just I compromised. I called it quantum supreme advantage here. Now that refers uh, the, the the term which was coined uh, by the physicist John Preskill uh, a decade ago. Uh, the, you know, the, the the idea goes back earlier. Uh, it refers to the first use of a quantum computer to perform some well-defined mathematical task faster than we currently know how to do it uh, using any classical computer on Earth, even, even a, a large supercomputer. Um, uh, now, uh, please note that I did not say a useful task. Okay, so uh, this doesn't have to be something like, you know, an, uh, an NP-complete problem or, or factoring an integer. It could be a completely artificial benchmark problem. Okay, uh, we're just, you know, trying to, to demonstrate the reality of, of, uh, of a speed-up based on quantum interference. Okay, uh, but, um, you know, having, having said that, we do want the task to be something well-defined. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I don't want, you know, someone to just point to some random molecule that they found in their lab and say, well, you know, uh, uh, um, no one has found a fast enough way to simulate this molecule using a conventional computer. So I'm therefore going to define this molecule to be a computer that a special purpose computer that achieves supremacy over classical computers on the task of simulating itself, All right? That just seems a little too tautological, okay? So uh, in order to do better than that, uh, what we want really is some kind of programmable device, okay? A device that is able to accept, you know, a large variety of different inputs, okay? And then we wanna do a fair comparison where both, you know, our device, our quantum computer, you know, and a competing classical computer uh, will get exactly the same input and they have to perform exactly the same task, okay, which is, you know, a task that we can mathematically define, you know, sort of uh, independent of the, the physical details of our quantum computer, right, and we can test, 
whether that task has been solved successfully or not. And so we can test both the classical computer and the quantum computer to see have they done the task. And both should be able to do it, you know, given enough time. But the quantum computer should be much faster. Okay? Even, you know, if we allow uh, some, 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 at some adversary, some skeptic, to optimize the code uh, uh, on the classical computer uh, as much as they like. Okay, so, you know, you can think of uh, this as a, a, a dilution refrigerator for a superconducting quantum computer on the left. Uh, th that's what they look like uh, versus, you know, a classical supercomputer such as uh, uh, um, um, IBM Summit uh, on the right. OK, uh, you know, we, we, we would like to beat what can be done classically. OK, and now crucially, not only do we want the quantum computer to win in this race, but we want to rule out any explanation for how the quantum computer won other than uh, you know, it did so by exploiting you know, interference in a superposition of two to the n amplitudes, where n was the number of qubits and was, was large, was you know, 50 or 60 or something like that. Uh, so you know, I don't want uh, uh, a device that is hard to simulate just for some incidental reason that you know it's some special purpose hardware and uh, uh, you know maybe it's uh, complicated to simulate, but for for reasons having nothing to do with quantum mechanics, you know, I really want you know the 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 reason for the speed up to be you know the the enormity of the Hilbert space. Okay, the, 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 the sheer you know, number of amplitudes that are being maintained in a superposition. Okay, now some people ask, what is the point of uh, doing a quantum supremacy experiment, right? But to me, it's almost self-explanatory. It's like saying, you know, what is the point of the Wright brothers airplane, right? It was not itself a useful airplane, you know, it only flew for uh, 12 seconds, you know, in the first flight, only held one person. Okay, but... Uh, it was demonstrating the point that, you know, uh, uh, controllable, you know, uh, uh, heavier than air flight, you know, is possible, you know, and not just allowed by the laws of physics, but, you know, can, can actually be achieved using the technology of uh, 1903. Okay. And in the same way, we want to show that real quantum speed ups are actually achievable, you know, using the technology of the early 21st century. Um, now, uh, I, I've joked uh, often that, that, that for me, uh, uh, personally, you know, the, the number one application of a quantum computer uh, has always been uh, not, you know, uh, uh, quantum simulations, not uh, breaking cryptographic codes, not AI or machine learning. It's always simply been refuting the quantum computing skeptics, okay? just disproving the uh, uh, you know, distinguished computer scientists and physicists like uh, uh, Gil Kalai, uh, Leonid Levin, you know, many others who have argued that uh, 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 useful quantum computers will forever be impossible uh, in our world. Um, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, I think it would be amazing if they're right. That would be a revolutionary for our understanding of physics. Uh, but, you know, we should directly test the question, right? And quantum supremacy, uh, in some sense, is aiming to do precisely that, okay? It's, it's not yet testing whether we can scale quantum computing to uh, thousands or millions of qubits, right? It's not yet testing uh, whether we can uh, build error corrected qubits, uh, whether we can uh, factor numbers, or, you know, do Shor's algorithm, things like that. But it is testing whether we can get some speed up, uh, but using quantum computation, which was, you know, one of the central questions at issue. All right, so let me now give you a brief history of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage before talking to you about what has been achieved just within the past few years. Okay, so, um, you know, in back in 1982, uh, Richard Feynman um, suggested, you know, building a, a quantum computer. Uh, uh, and, you know, at that time, he was only able to think of one application for it, uh, namely that it would be, it would seem to be exponentially faster than a classical computer for the task of simulating quantum mechanics itself. 
Okay, uh, you know, now, uh, uh, you know, while that sounds pretty obvious, uh, you know, to this day, uh, quantum simulation is arguably the most important application of quantum computing that we know about. Uh, you know, it ha could have tremendous applications in uh, designing new materials, designing new drugs, um, you know, um, understanding uh, high temperature superconductors, um, all kinds of things. And, you know, we are very confident that quantum computers will help for it. Uh, so, um, you know, so, so that, that was maybe, you know, the, the original uh, quantum supremacy. Okay. But, you know, it remained kind of a subject for, for physicists or sort of a, you know, a weird uh, speculation. It was really brought under the umbrella of theoretical computer science, uh, you know, around 1993 which was when, you know, uh, Bernstein and Vazirani uh, in a seminal paper uh, defined uh, BQP or bounded error quantum polynomial time. This is the quantum generalization of, you know, the class P, you know, sort of the, the, the set of decision problems that are solvable uh, by some uh, uh, polynomial time quantum algorithm. Uh, so, you know, I know uh, Avi already mentioned BQP. Uh, here is a very rough picture of how we think that it might fit in with the uh, uh, conventional complexity classes like P and NP. Um, so we know that BQP contains classical P, you know, everything a classical computer can do, uh, a quantum computer can efficiently simulate, um, but BQP might be larger. You know, I drew it with a wavy boundary since, you know, everything quantum is uh, supposed to be spooky and weird. Okay, but uh, um, uh, we do not think that BQP contains the NP complete problems. You know, uh, we don't know. You know, of course, we can't prove it doesn't contain them because we can't even prove that P is not equal to NP, you know, uh, let alone BQP. Um, for all we know today, um, NP and BQP might just be two incomparable classes. Okay, so, so there could be NP problems that are not in BQP. There could also be BQP problems that are not in NP. It is problems that a quantum computer can solve, but for which a classical computer cannot even efficiently check the answers. Okay, now, Chris, the um, super famous discovery that sort of brought quantum computing to you know, the attention of the rest of the world was uh, Peter Shor's discovery in 1994 that the problem of factoring integers uh, is in BQP. Okay? There is a fast quantum algorithm for factoring integers. Um, to show that, uh, Shor had to exploit very, very special properties of the factoring problem, you know, arising from group theory and, and number theory. Um, you know, it doesn't work for, for NP complete problems. Okay. Uh, um, factoring, as we know, is very special, but it's also very important because, you know, for better or worse, um, most of the public key encryption that we currently use to protect the internet, you know, is based on the belief that factoring is hard. Okay. Factoring or a few related problems like a discrete logarithms or like elliptic curve problems, which it turns out that Shor's algorithm can also solve uh, or, you know, are, are, are also contained in, in BQP. Okay, so what that meant is that uh, if someone builds a uh, truly scalable, you know, and programmable quantum computer, then they could break almost all of the encryption uh, that is currently protecting the internet. Okay, so so that that's you know obviously a big deal, you know, and it led to, to the immediate question: Well, can that actually be done? You know, is this just a theory, or uh, you know, could you really build a, a quantum computer? Now, as I said, there were distinguished skeptics who said, you know, you will never be able to control qubits well enough to do this. Okay, because uh, you know the problem is um, um, uh, uh, qubits are inherently very fragile. Right. So, uh, you know, I said before that, uh, uh, you know, if you measure a qubit, uh, you force it randomly to collapse to either the zero state or the one state. OK, but crucially, it doesn't have to be you who or, or any person who is measuring the qubit. Any sort of information, any sort of interaction with the external environment, with the radiation, with the air in the room, with, you know, the wafer of the chip. Uh, that carries away information about whether the qubit is zero or one. 
will have exactly the same effect on the qubit as if someone had measured it. Okay, so what this means is that to, uh, in order to do a quantum computation, you have to keep the qubits incredibly well isolated from any kind of interaction with the outside world, but at the same time, not perfectly isolated because you have to tell the qubits what to do. You have to apply unitary transformations to them, you know, in a precisely choreographed way. Okay, so, you know, these are incredibly hard requirements. You could imagine that, you know, maybe it's just like a perpetual motion machine, right? Maybe it could never be done. But, you know, the thing that convinced um, uh, almost all experts that it can be done was a further um, epical discovery uh, in the mid 1990s. And that was called the theory of quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. And basically what it showed is that you, in order to do a quantum computation that's you know as, as long as you want with as many qubits as you want, uh, you don't have to uh, have perfect qubits. Okay, it is enough to have qubits that are very, very, very good. Okay, you know, that have a, a, a rate of error that is sort of sufficiently small. Okay, and as long as the physical error rate is small enough, then you can encode uh, uh, the computation you care about using very clever error correcting codes. Okay, so where, where each logical qubit would be encoded by an entangled state of hundreds or thousands of physical qubits, okay, in such a way that even if, you know, your physical qubits are sort of collapsing, you know, or being lost at a certain rate, uh, you can sort of dynamically monitor that and uh, correct for it and protect the encoded logical qubits that you care about. And you, in fact, you can use your noisy qubits to simulate qubits that have a lower noise rate and those better qubits in turn could simulate qubits that have an even lower noise rate and so on, so that you could effectively simulate perfect qubits, even using imperfect hardware. Okay, now, uh, so, and that has really set the engineering agenda for, for quantum computing in, you know, the quarter century uh, since then. Okay, uh, 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 unfortunately, it is staggeringly hard. You could say that it reduces it to merely an engineering problem. Okay, but it, but if so, it is an immense engineering problem. Okay, the uh, um, uh, physicists and the, the the engineers have been able to improve the uh, uh, um, the parameters, you know, the the error rates on their physical qubits by several orders of magnitude. Uh, uh, in, in over the past 25 years. Okay, but, you know, if, if you wanted to use the, uh, the known, you know, uh, uh, fault tolerance constructions in order to scale up and, you know, build a, a truly scalable quantum computer, there would be a couple of orders of magnitude still to go. So, you know, there's been amazing progress, but it doesn't look like we're going to have a truly scalable quantum computer, you know, in the next, I don't know, you know, five years or something. Okay. After that, I'm not going to uh, venture a guess because, you know, it partly depends on just how badly people want this and, you know, how much are they willing to spend? You know, after all, you know, in the late 1930s, uh, uh, a nuclear bomb also looked like it was decades into the future, but, you know, then, you know, something happened that, you know, made, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the U S government decide that it, that it really, really wanted that. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so, you know, building a, a, a truly error corrected quantum computer, you know, looks like, you know, a, a still, you know, a staggeringly hard problem. Uh, but uh, about a, a decade ago, my then student Alex Arkhipov and I uh, proposed uh, a different route to, uh, um, um, to, to try to achieve quantum supremacy, you know, uh, a quantum speed up in a much uh, a quicker and dirtier way. Okay, so uh, uh, our proposal was called boson sampling. Uh, so it was a route to, you know, to just demonstrate quantum supremacy, not necessarily do anything useful, okay, or anything scalable, but, but just do something that is well-defined and that's hard for a classical computer to simulate. Uh, uh, boson sampling used optical devices. Okay, so it so it just uh, involved a bunch of photons that you would generate and send through a network of beam splitters, and that you would then measure uh, to see where the photons ended up. 
Uh, and and it's sort of the key idea was to switch our attention from decision problems, which are you know the the usual thing we study in uh, theoretical computer science, you know problems with yes or no answers, uh, to sampling problems. Okay, so uh, so a problem where the task, the goal, is to output a sample from some specified probability distribution, call it D, over n bit strings. Okay, and so we try to design a distribution D with the property that you know a rudimentary quantum device can you know efficiently generate samples from D, but we don't expect any polynomial time classical algorithm to be able to do the same. Okay, so and in fact, what what we showed was that uh, there 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 are such Ds where you know, the evidence that there's not a fast classical sampling method uh, seems very, very strong. So you, know, you can prove results like if a classical computer could sample from that exact distribution in polynomial time, then the polynomial time hierarchy would collapse to the third level. Okay, so uh, um, um, you know, uh, if, if you know or care what it means, like you know, p to the sharp p would equal bpp to the np. Uh, things like that would happen. Okay, so uh, now, admittedly, you know, the the physically more relevant question is, well, what if I had only a classical algorithm that approximately sampled from D? Because after all, the experiment itself can presumably only sample approximately. And there it becomes a harder question. There we were able to give evidence that there's still not an efficient classical sampling algorithm. You know, we gave a reduction. We showed that if such an, uh, a classical algorithm existed, then it would lead to um, uh, surprising classical algorithms for estimating the permanence of random matrices, basically. But we were not able to show that it would collapse the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, that remains uh, a, a central open problem uh, in this area. Okay. Now, uh, around the same time, and independently of us, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard uh, proposed a similar scheme uh, for getting quantum supremacy based on a sampling problem. Uh, theirs was not based on photonics. It was based on uh, 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 what they called instantaneous quantum polytime, or IQP, uh, basically just a bunch of qubits that are uh, sort of acted on by a certain kind of uh, commuting Hamiltonians. Okay, so then um, in 2012, as I said, John Preskill coined this term quantum supremacy uh, for things like boson sampling or IQP. Okay, so for things like what, what we had described. Uh, so, you know, ways to sort of demonstrate a quantum speed up that don't necessarily require uh, a full error corrected quantum computer, okay, but that could maybe be done uh, in. Um, uh, uh, you know, using a, a noisy device, uh, you know, the, the, you know in, in the next five to 10 years. Um, and, you know, he suggested this as, a, you know, a, an excellent goal for uh, the experimentalists. Then, you know, in 2014, uh, Google hired uh, John Martinez, who's maybe, you know, the, one of the most famous superconducting qubits uh, experimentalists in the world. Uh, they formed a lab uh, in Santa Barbara uh, that explicitly aimed to do the first ever uh, demonstration of quantum supremacy uh, using a programmable device. Uh, you know, and their plan was to do something like boson sampling, except adapted to their hardware. Okay, so you know, their, their, theirs was not a photonic device. It was based on a, a, a two-dimensional array of, of qubits uh, on a superconducting chip. And so they just wanted to solve a hard sampling problem, you know, using using that setup with, you know, 50 to 60 qubits. Uh, and so then in 2017, um, my uh, uh, then student, uh, Li Ji Chen, and I uh, adapted the theory of boson sampling to uh, a setup like Google's. You know, that was uh, it was much cheaper for us to do that than for uh, Google to adapt its experiment to the theory. Uh, and then um, uh, two years ago, so really, you know, just before COVID uh, took over the world, uh, Google uh, published uh, the first ever claim of quantum supremacy. Uh, was on the cover of Nature. Uh, so their experiment involved uh, 53 qubits 
they actually built a chip with 54 qubits, but uh, one of them didn't work. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, now with 53, that's that uh, two to the 53 power gives you about nine quadrillion amplitudes. Um, and, you know, they, they uh, repeatedly ran an experiment, you know, and sampled to collect a bunch of ra random output strings of 53 bits each. Uh, it took them about three minutes to collect a sufficient number of samples. And, you know, they uh, uh, um, uh, uh, suggested that, that getting the same samples with a classical computer seemed to be a lot harder. Okay, they, they estimated, you know, 10,000 10, years to do it with the best uh, uh, algorithm that they knew. Uh, now, if just a few weeks later, uh, IBM, which is uh, one of Google's main competitors in superconducting qubits, uh, hit back with a rebuttal paper. Uh, and they said, well, we can classically spoof Google's results in only two and a half days, which of course is a lot better than 10,000 years, although still more than three minutes. Uh, uh, now, in order to do that, they, they had, you know, their proposal would be to use Summit, which is literally the largest supercomputer uh, on Earth. Uh, it has uh, about 250 petabytes of hard disk space, which turns out to be just barely enough to store, to just explicitly write down a vector of two to the 53 complex numbers. Okay, so their proposal was to just do a brute force simulation. Just write down the vector, you know, uh, in hard disk, and then just do a, a bunch of matrix vector multiplications, you know, and, and they estimated that that would take a few days. They didn't actually do it because, you know, it just, it is very, very expensive to, you know, commandeer uh, three days uh, on the largest supercomputer on the planet. Okay? But, you know, I, I, I believe that it would work. Uh, you know, and, and debates about classical spoofability of these experiments have continued to rage on. Um, as we'll see, uh, uh, skeptics have since designed uh, uh, better simulations, you know, that could uh, simulate Google's experiment in just a few days uh, on a smaller computer than Summit. But at the same time, the quantum supremacy experiments themselves have also been improving. Okay, so, you know, the, the target that you're aiming for has, has gotten, you know, uh, uh, harder. Uh, so, you know, you can think of it kind of like, you know, uh, Kasparov versus Deep Blue, like, you know, human versus computers in chess back in 1996, 1997, right? We are just in the era where, you know, it's, it's a real fight. And hopefully a few years from now, uh, um, um, you know, the quantum super the quantum experiments will have decisively pulled ahead, uh, at least for these sampling tasks. It doesn't mean for, 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 for everything. Okay, so yeah, so, so uh, in late 2020, uh, you, the, a group at uh, USTC in Hefe, China, uh, reported a demonstration of boson sampling uh, uh, with 50 to 70 photons. So they actually implemented our original, you know, Mayan Arkhipov's original proposal uh, using like a giant optical table. And then um, um, early this year, USTC reported an improved boson sampling experiment, this time with about 110 photons. Uh, they also reported uh, a superconducting qubits uh, based uh, quantum supremacy experiment, just like Google's, with 56 qubits, so three more than Google had managed. And then just last week, uh, they uh, announced uh, their latest experiment, which uses 60 superconducting qubits. Yeah, yeah, you can you can find it on the archive uh, there. Uh, um, although the the, uh, the the quality of the qubits is not quite as high as Google's, okay? but. Uh, um, but, but they're up to 60. Okay, so now let me just talk briefly about what exactly did Google and USTC do in these experiments. And for uh, concreteness, let me focus on uh, the superconducting qubit experiments. Okay, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a similar story that I could tell about the boson sampling experiments. Um, so basically they build uh, a two-dimensional array of uh, of, of, of qubits, okay, they, they have uh, control, so, so the in, in this picture, the qubits sort of live on the x's, 
they are sort of uh, currents that can flow around the coil in two different states that we take to encode a zero or a one. Um, uh, you know, and, and by the way, these are enormous by the standards of qubits. You know, these are uh, almost big enough to see with the naked eye. Okay, uh, you've got, uh, you know, the, these, these little boxes are uh, places where one qubit meets another one. And so where, where you have a, a coupling, like a two qubit gate, you know, where you can control what is happening there using classical signals that you, you send onto the chip. All of, all of these qubits live on a computer chip that, you know, looks like a pretty normal chip, you know, uh, uh, it's the same size. Uh, but then that chip is placed into a dilution refrigerator. That's that thing that looks kind of like an upside down wedding cake, okay, where, you know, it's progressively cooled, you know, each layer uh, colder than the layer above it. Uh, until, you know, the layer where the chip is, uh, uh, you have cooling to about a hundredth of a degree uh, above absolute zero, about, you know, 0.01 Kelvin, okay? And at that temperature, uh, the current superconduct, okay? Superconductivity is a quantum phenomenon that in particular allows the currents to exist in superpositions of the zero state and the one state, at least for a very brief time for uh, a few tens of microseconds, okay? So that doesn't sound very long, okay? But it is long enough to do, you know, maybe a few dozen layers of quantum gates of, you know, of, of unitary transformations uh, of our choice on these qubits and then still be able to, to read out a signal. Okay, so what happens is that a quantum circuit C, by which we mean just a sequence of couplings of the qubits is chosen randomly. Um, the, the depth, so the number of layers of gates was 20 in Google's uh, uh, experiment two years ago. Uh, in, in the latest experiment from USTC, uh, the depth is 24, okay? But now over and over, uh, we do the following. We initialize all N of the qubits to some standard initial state typically the state zero. We then apply the circuit C to them. And then we just measure each of the qubits in the zero or one basis. So we just, you know, ask each qubit whether it's a zero or a one. Each time we do that, we get an independent sample, you know, call the sample S sub I um, from some distribution over N bit strings, okay, which is defined by our circuit. Okay, so the distribution uh, I could call it D sub C, okay? It's a, it de depends on, on our choice of circuit C. And each sample S sub I is sampled from that distribution, okay? And, and is an N bit string. So now after, because each sample only takes a few tens of microseconds uh, to get, after a few minutes, we can get millions of samples. So let's say S1 up to SK, where K is a few million. Okay, but now comes an absolutely crucial question. We, you know, once we've collected these samples, we've stored them in our classical computer. Now, how do we check if they were actually sampled from our distribution, D sub C? You know, I mean, for that matter, how do we check whether a quantum computer was even used at all, right? How do we check that these aren't just uniformly random strings, for example? So we have to apply some kind of statistical test. Okay, so uh, here's the test that Google chose. So using many classical computers, plus you know, their, their knowledge of the circuit C, you know, having chosen that circuit, uh, plus you know, as much time as needed. So you know, like heroic effort with a classical supercomputer, uh, they calculate a number that they call the LXEB, or the Linear Cross Entropy Benchmark. Okay, and that number is defined as follows. It's simply uh, a weighted average of uh, all of, uh, for each observed sample, uh, the probability that an ideal quantum circuit, an ideal quantum computer running the circuit C would have generated that sample. Okay, so it's the sum from over all I, from one up to K, of uh, sort of the, the probability that the an ideal circuit C, you know, initialized to the all zero state would have generated uh, uh, the output S sub i. 
Okay, that's, you know, so it's the squared absolute value of the amplitude uh, of the circuit C taking the all zero initial state to the SI output state. Scott, I'm Here sorry to interrupt yes. you, but if you want to have time for some questions, it would be good if we... Uh, oh, okay. Come All to right, well, then, let me just, let me, then, then let me just take two minutes. Yes. Okay. All right, thanks. So, um, uh, so uh, um, now, you know, it turns out that with uh, uh, a completely, you know, useless, just random classical sampling, you would expect this LXEB number to be about one. With an ideal quantum computer with no noise, you would expect this number to be about two. That's just a calculation that you can do. And intuitively, it's because uh, some S sub i's will enjoy more constructive interference in their amplitudes. So they'll have a little bit, they'll be a little bit more probable than others, right? And LXCB is checking, are the samples that you generate actually correlated with the ones that were predicted to have higher probabilities? Because you know they enjoyed more constructive interference and had you know slightly larger than a two to the minus n probability of showing up. Okay, so long story short, in its experiment, Google uh, uh, achieved a linear cross entropy score of about one point zero zero two. Okay, so just slightly better than the trivial classical score. Okay, but they were able to show that you know to like ten or twenty sigmas that yes, this really is different from one. Right, they really did, you know, achieve a, a, a net benefit here. Uh, in USTC's experiment, uh, uh, the LXEB score was smaller, but still bounded above one. Okay, and now a crucial question for us as theorists was, you know, is that a difficult task for a classical computer? So, you know, how hard is it for a classical computer to um, uh, uh, to to produce samples, you know, whose LXEB score is bounded above one? Okay, well, we're not sure, you know, I mean, you know, we can't even prove that P is not equal to P space. We can't rule out that there's a fast classical way to do that, but we were able to give some hardness reductions. Okay, so uh, we could say that any better than brute force classical algorithm to spoof samples with uh, a linear cross entropy score bounded above one, if it existed, then it could be turned into a classical algorithm that would actually estimate amplitudes in random quantum circuits a little bit better than a trivial algorithm would do. Okay, so, you know, it seems kind of unlikely. So, so you know, that remains, you know, about the state of the art. Now, I, you know, I had an, a, a little FAQ, but since I'm out of time, I think I will just turn things over to whatever questions uh, you and the audience actually have. And with that, uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Scott, for this wonderful talk and this, I mean, about this very exciting um, development. So we have lots of questions, people ask, so we mm -hmm. will just get to some of them. And I okay. mean, one which many uh, people wanted to know about, how soon do you think will quantum computing uh, impact our real world, real life world, yeah. and in particular, make existing algorithms, for example, in cryptography, unusable? Yeah. So, of course, I get that question in every single talk that I give. Uh, and the answer that I give, you know, is the same, which is that if I had any ability to predict how long things would take, then I wouldn't be uh, a professor. I wouldn't be, you know, a theoretical computer scientist. I would be an investor and I would be rich. OK, so, uh, uh, you know, so in some sense, you're, you're, a, you're asking the wrong person right now. Now, uh, but what I can tell you is that in order to build a quantum computer that would, you know, not just achieve quantum supremacy, you know, uh, but but threaten uh, cryptography. So, you know, break RSA, break uh, uh, public key crypto systems like that. Uh, you, you're going to need error corrected qubits. OK, and that's much harder than what we're talking about here, okay? So uh, in order to do error correction, you'd probably need, you know, th thousands of physical qubits for every logical qubit, and you need thousands of logical qubits. So at that point, you're talking about millions or hundreds of, of millions of qubits and more reliable than any qubits that, that we can build now. So that looks pretty scary. You know, I, I hope that we will live to see it. But, you know, the, but, but there are several things that have to happen first, right? We, mm -hmm. you know, we'd like to see quantum computers used for uh, 
quantum simulation. That's probably coming a lot sooner because um, that probably doesn't require full error correction. Uh, you know, and we'd like to see even the first demonstration of useful quantum error correction. That has not been done yet either, but groups all over the world are currently racing to be the first to demonstrate that. So another question, I mean, you described that it's a huge engineering um, problem to build a quantum computer. The audience mm -hmm. is mainly mathematicians and computer scientists. So one question was where uh, do computer scientists can, I mean, make the most impact in current day quantum computing? That's an excellent question. Uh, there are several major ways where uh, that math and CS people can make an impact on near-term things. I mean, in some sense, this talk was an example of that, right? Like you could say, I'm about as far as you could possibly get on the theoretical side of quantum computing, right? You know, I'm barely even allowed into a lab, you know, for fear that I would break something. Okay, or, you know, or confuse the uh, dilution refrigerator for the coffee maker or something. Okay, but, uh, you know, the work that we did on boson sampling, which started out as just pure complexity theory, you know, ended up, you know, contributing to this experimental effort, you know, which is one of the more exciting things that I ever had the, the privilege to be involved with. You know, and, and uh, uh, you know, so, so theorists are needed for uh, designing better error correcting codes you know, ones that can cope with higher levels of uh, noise. You know, that's a major, major open problem where we need new ideas. Theorists are also needed for figuring out what can be done that is useful or interesting with quantum computers of the near term. Ones where, you know, you might have only 100 or 200 qubits at the most, you know, only a limited number of gates that you can apply to them because they're not error corrected. Is there anything useful that you can do in that regime? You know, interesting cryptographic tasks like generating certified random numbers, something I've been thinking about, or, you know, other algorithmic tasks. Those are all places where theorists can contribute. Yes. So what you just stressed, the um, pseudo-random numbers or certified uh, mm -hmm. pseudo-random numbers, there was another question which also makes a connection to Avi's talk again. So yes. can we think of quantum observations as, in some sense, the only pure or true source or, I mean, good source of randomness uh, in our world? Well, in a sense, that's true. Uh, so uh, the randomness of quantum measurement outcomes is the only randomness uh, that the known fundamental laws of physics uh, tell us about, okay? Uh, all, in some sense, all other randomness is, you know, can be understood as merely ignorance, as just, you know, sort of lack of knowledge of the detailed microscopic state of our system, of, you know, the position of every particle, okay? But the randomness of quantum measurement outcomes, uh, you know, as you could get with a standard Geiger counter or a photo detector or something, you know, quantum mechanics insists that that is really generated freshly, randomly, you know, by, by this, uh, uh, absolute value squared probability rule every time you make a measurement. Okay? Now, having said that, if you only use quantum mechanics as a source of random numbers and you know nothing else, so if you just prepare a bunch of qubits in the state zero plus one and then measure them to get a zero or, or a one, right? You know, just have, have a standard quantum random number generator. I mean, that already exists. That's hardware that you can already purchase, but we wouldn't count that as a quantum computer yet because uh, you know it's not using interference, right? It's just yeah. using quantum mechanics as a source of randomness. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for this wonderful lecture and Q and A. So we are unfortunately out of time. So uh, thank you, and perhaps you also round if uh, young researchers ask you questions over the conference tool. And now. I would like to invite everyone to join the Speed Scientific Networking. So just uh, stay on the tool and you will be assigned some random other participant of the HLF. See you later. Mm -hmm.